Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second interview in the Inspire series. Today, I will be speaking with Tabitha Goldstorm, who is a tech entrepreneur, co-founder of Cognition X, which is an AI advice platform, a bit like uh, the Ghostbusters hotline, but for AI. She is also head of the UK government's AI council. Afterwards, I have lots of questions for Tabitha, uh, many of which you have sent in to me. So thank you so much for all your contributions. Over to you, Tabitha. Hello, thank you, Framingham, for having me. Am I right in saying that you're going to talk for a few minutes to begin with? Yeah, it'll, it'll help because then it will mean that there's some context when you ask me questions. I don't have to then go like into my history. I can answer them quite quick, quickly. Yeah. And then it means I always think that it's a better conversation. Yes, fine. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, and then I want to leave you with some advice. Um, and we will look at um, what artificial artificial intelligence is, which is uh, what I have dedicated my career to. So first, um, I want to start where um, the age that um, that I remember the most at school. So here was me and my little brother at a school in Battersea in London. We absolutely loved playing with frogs. Um, that was our biggest um, our biggest passion really was the climate and the the garden. To, uh, but very quickly, I realised that I I wasn't um, I wasn't going to be a scientist. But in fact, I loved the arts, and so I went to a school called Bedells in Hampshire. Uh, it was a free, loving, free spirited school. Um, I was able to really spread my wings. The thing that I think Bedells helped me with the most was I was a dyslexic child um, and Bedells really taught uh, me that it was okay to learn differently from the other kids in my class and that led me to not take the traditional path a lot of my friends were going to universities um, and to study history and and I actually decided to go to art college so here's a picture of me at Wimbledon Art College directing people doing the work as you can see I probably should have uh, got my I got, got stuck in a bit more art college was a lot of fun mainly this kind of fun um, and that's when I realized that really I needed to knuckle down a bit more and I decided that the industry I was the most excited by was advertising so I went to a university called London College of Communication, which is, as you can imagine, in London. Um, and it is part of the University of the Arts. And I dedicated the three years to um, how brands worked to reach consumers. I absolutely loved my degree. It meant that I had the time and was the proximity to all of the big ad agencies in London. So I worked during my degree and really um, for the first time uh, in many cases I think I had found what um, what excited me because it was all about uh, both people and creativity together. It was also the year that Facebook was launched. At the time you can see here it was called The Facebook. It looks very different to what I imagine um, you all used. Um, it, it was an absolute revelation to me. I know that now there's TikTok and Instagram and, uh, and, and Snapchat, but at the time this was the first, the first place that really me and my friends were able to communicate online. And there were other things around beforehand, but this was fun, you know, this was really um, revolutionary. And it made me realize that the ad world was gonna be the old world. We could actually talk to consumers directly using things like Facebook. And so I co-founded a company called T5M, which you can see here um, is uh, basically looked at how could you create content, so whether it was fashion, film, sports, beauty, and get it directly to people in their homes rather than via big broadcasters. So instead of going past Channel 4 um, or ITV, uh, we were able to get this content directly to people's homes via Facebook and YouTube and so on. And it was an absolutely amazing time of my life. Uh, and very quickly, I realized that it was hard work. <laughs> Technically, uh, we were doing a lot of heavy lifting. And that was actually the moment that I heard about artificial intelligence. And it was very difficult to learn about artificial intelligence. And the whole 
I guess the whole world was shifting. People were going from doing things automated to going to doing things more, uh, uh, sorry, going to things manually to going to do things more automated. And so um, my co-founder of T5M and I decided that we should pivot uh, and uh, we we sold that last business. We, we took it public. I don't know whether that's a common term to everybody, but we, we took it public on the, the stock exchange um, uh, as an IPO. Um, and we did that uh, in, a, in a junior market, which meant that we had the freedom to, um, uh, to, to, to float and then exit the business. And then we set up this company, which is where I am now, called Cognition X. And what we do here is we connect people who have questions, like I did about artificial intelligence, with people who have the answers. And we also run a big festival. So here you can see in the center of, of London in, uh, in King's Cross, we host over 30,000 people um, to come and visit and hear from these experts. Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, uh, was one of my favorite speakers this year. Um, and really, we try and address not just the big people like Sadiq Khan, but also young people like yourselves. So you can see here, there's me on the left. Um, I was, it was quite cold and I was very pregnant. And so I'm wearing a big brown coat and talking to some of the most amazing young, um, young people who had entered into a hackathon to create some artificial intelligent products to um, try and survive on Mars. And um, that was uh, a real highlight for me. And I'd love to, afterwards to talk about how maybe some of you could come to COGX one day. I also advise the government. Um, the, this is the cabinet room when Theresa May, you can see there on the left, uh, was the prime minister. I was invited um, many times to Downing Street to talk about what artificial intelligence impact was gonna be, and also as an entrepreneur and a founder, how the, the world was going to change um, due to this new technology. You can see there Matt Hancock, um, who is obviously now our uh, Secretary of State for Health, so you might recognize his face. The rest of the people here are all, all awesome entrepreneurs. So why did I get so excited about AI and what is AI? So I've heard that there is there is a handful of people who are actually going on to study artificial intelligence. So for those people, um, I apologize. This is very basic. Um, but what I really want to say is that AI isn't just for the very technical people, the very mathsy people. This is for everybody. It matters, as you can see, for people like me who was into arts, as well as people who are into to science. So. If uh, you don't know this term, don't worry. A lot of people are still asking, you know, what is AI uh, in industry as well as well as young people. I've actually found that a lot of the time it's the young people who know more than the grown-ups. But here's a good way of uh, looking at it. The, the the dictionary is always a good start, and I'll explain why in a second. But the theory um, of AI is that it is able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. So you can see things like visual perception, speech recognition, decision-making, and translation between languages. So all of those different topics are things that you would imagine a human being able to do. But what scientists are now focused on is how do you get a machine to do those things? A lot of people think it's a little bit like Chappie or iRobot or the killer machines from Terminator. But I, I'm here to say, nope, uh, artificial intelligence is not about the movies. It's actually already in your pocket. You use it if you've ever used Siri on your phone, you've used Google Maps to get somewhere with real time traffic, or you've used one of those awesome filters that I love on uh, Instagram, like which Harry Potter character you are. So you're interacting with it every single day. It's also implemented in our technologies across the board. So here you can see it's being used in the classrooms. There are um, robo advisors in banks. There are AI that's painting. There's AI in our medical um, in our medical professions. And really across the industries and the different sectors of the economy, it's making a huge difference. As I started by telling you, me and my brother were obsessed with um, the planet and, and what we could see in the biology in our garden. 
I'm also the most excited about AI's impact on the climate. Um, you all know better than I do how important it is that we look after our future and your future and the planet and artificial intelligence can address some of, um, some of the challenges that we face. So it is an incredibly important piece of technology to understand um, its impact, but also how it works. So I'm gonna give you a quick primer this is not detailed. And if you're excited by this, I hope that you will go and have a look at other videos online. I can share with your teachers some really good resources. But for now, I want to give you a quick overview. So imagine you had an AI system, as we spoke about before, that could see. And you gave it lots and lots and lots of pictures of dogs. And you gave it lots and lots and lots of pictures of cats. You can see here that if you then showed it a picture of a cat, it would know it was a cat. So you think, gosh, very smart. Yeah, that makes sense. But what if I gave that AI system a picture of a white dog? So you see here in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a white dog. The AI system, what's it going to think? It's going to think it's a cat because it's never seen a picture of a white dog. So here you can both see how an AI system works, but also its limitations. And those limitations don't matter too much if it's a cat. But what if you had an AI that looked at film directors, for example, and then predicted scripts that would become successful? Now, this is when I think we need to start worrying because the current system, and I don't know if any of you saw that the Oscars this year, there were no female directors nominated for the best film category. So what if we trained an AI model like we did on the black dogs and the white cats to think that all film directors looked like this? The challenge would be if it then saw a script by a woman, it would expect that script to be by a man. So you can start to see quite quickly how bias and discrimination can creep into these models. And that's why I want to leave you with four tips. The first is that AI is for absolutely everybody. Every single one of you need to get, needs to get involved in this. Even if you don't understand the technology of it and you don't want to, you've got to understand the impact. And every single class and subject that you look at, this is my school, Thomas's, will be impacted by it. It's not just in science and technology and computer science and maths where you'll learn about AI, but actually it's gonna affect English, geography, classics, and so on. One of the things that I want to advise you to do, which sometimes your teachers and definitely your parents might say not to do so much, but actually I think you should be talking to machines politely. Make sure that you're using, if you have an Alexa in your home or you have a Siri on your phone if you're, or your parents, um, or pets phone, depending on how old you are, make sure you're practicing to use it. It can be quite frustrating, but it's really important to try and figure out how you're gonna form those questions and get the robots and the machines to do the hard work. Fourth, of course, you must stay safe online. Artificial intelligence makes it even easier for trolls and hacking and cyberbullying. And so I commend the efforts that have gone in to make sure that um, everybody can stay safe online and make sure that you, um, you, you follow those guidelines. But lastly, I say have fun. Envisage the future that you might see um, could be possible and start to research and look around and find where AI could be applied to um, that future that you hope for. The adults um, certainly don't have um, any better understanding of this than you do. Uh, it's, the, it's the vision that's really important. And so I'm excited to, um, to think that all of you on this call might be slightly inspired to uh, learn more. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? I'm excited. I've heard that there's some, been some questions sent in beforehand. So I'm quite excited to hear these. Tabitha, thank you so much. And I have got lots of questions for you. Um, I'm going to take you back to the beginning of your um, presentation uh, to talk a little bit more about you when you were a child at school and what life was actually like then. D did you have um, did, did did you have certain people who inspired you when you were at school who sort of um, particular people who influenced the direction you took 
both initially into art and then beyond? Yeah, I think there were two types of people. There were the ones that I could see directly. So my mother was um, a magazine editor, and so I always saw um, creativity and working a working woman as a as an inspiration. And then the others were the um, were the were the sort of more famous people that I could see um, on in movies. And um, I have to admit, I thought that Oprah was just the coolest person ever. She had that empire building. Um, capacity and um, I was really inspired by by her and other women who had sort of taken um, the, the the chance on building businesses. Okay and um, you talk I've read in one or two articles that you had dyslexia yeah and um, how did that I have a question from one one pupil about the the connection between having dyslexia and learning to code and right. and how how big a challenge is that for for somebody so i think the key thing about dyslexia is that everybody is different and that's what it teaches us is that we learn differently we understand um things in a different way i was incredibly frustrated as a dyslexic child i found everything irritating because i was intelligent but not in the conventional way in many cases and I think that code for me, learning to code for me was a, it was a similar challenge because I struggled with languages. And so I personally struggled with code, uh, or at least the concept of how things were put together. However, I have some friends who are dyslexic and for them, that was the easiest thing ever. And, you know, they, they, they struggled with basic maths and yet coding was really easy. And I think it's actually about how you approach these things. Um, gaming and learning to code via games, I think, is probably one of dyslexic, dyslexic's um, secret weapons, because normally dyslexics are quite good at games. Or I, you know, I, per I say normally and I've just told you that everyone's different. <laughs> I personally love good a good game um, online or in person, but good games I think are good uh, are an interesting way to to break down the barriers of learning things that are difficult. And at what point did you learn to code? Did you learn that at school, or, or did you? Learn so, that so I don't code. This you is this, no, I am not. I am not a coder. I mean, this is this is one of the um, important things that I that I want to stress to everyone is that technology is something that you ha that you can get involved in without knowing how to code. Um, I know so many founders who run tech companies who can hire people and the engineers who know how to code. The key is to have a passion for technology and an understanding of what it can do and a vision for what the opportunities are. To actually learn to, to, to write lines of code is, is, is not compulsory. That's really interesting. I had a, that very specific question from one um, one student who is going on to to study um, AI. So that's really good to to hear. Um, now you talk about passion there, and clearly you 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 enjoyed life at school, and then you followed your passion into art. How important do you think it is for the young people now, our year thirteen, so about to? go off into to, to university and so forth to follow their passion more than anything else even if it's not the career that they end up pursuing that's a good question um i think passion drives so much of passion can drive you through so much of the difficult times um, and I think that that therefore means that it, probably above everything else is one of the most useful things to have. I, I remember as a child, someone saying to me, you know, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Um, and I, I do subscribe to that. I think that there is a feeling that if you have followed a passion, you therefore, um, when you hit an obstacle or a challenging economy, like uh, like I think we can all predict we're about to face, um, you can then lean on the passionate side of, of, of why you decided to do something. That said, um, I do think that we need to think quite practically now about what jobs are going to be around in the future and things are changing at such a pace that the 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 traditional world of having one job and staying in it all of your life like my parents did is just not there um and 
the the way that we should start thinking about our jobs is passion coupled with um, current trends and technology. So you want to make sure that your passion interweaves between those things. Um, you know, being a uh, impoverished artist might have been a passion of mine, but it certainly wouldn't have driven me to uh, to where I am today. So um, I think it's important to to be practical, pra passionately practical. <laughs> that's that's great. I I've been talking a lot with um, parents and with pupils about the fact that education has to change and it's mm. always evolving, but particularly now looking ahead. The, the adult world that we are going to be preparing our young people for is, is going to look very different to the one that we're in right now and, and things are changing so quickly. Do, do you think um, there is ever going to be a time where uh, teaching is going to be taken over by AI? Is, <laughs> is it one of those careers that we're going to find doesn't exist for us? Mm, no. <laughs> I think that what I love about AI and teaching is that what I hope happens and I uh, I believe will happen is that the AI systems will help teachers be able to spend more time with their pupils and more time doing the things that they are passionate about rather than marking or um, admin. Um, and so you could have an AI system that could help you with the with those with those things that are mundane, boring sometimes. Um, and therefore you would then have time, more time to, to focus on the pastoral care and really seeing which of your students is succeeding in one thing or another. And if we go back to my comment about dyslexia and how everyone's different, if you can use AI to track progress for your students you can then intervene and actually spend more time with each individual um, on the topic that they might be more more with so are you saying that essentially robots can do a certain amount but when they're never going to have empathy and so those skills are always going to be needed that is that is exactly what i'm saying um, the, the fact that uh, robots don't get tired or feel hungry or have any feelings at all. It's even a ridiculous th thought to, to even use the word feelings. Mm -hmm. The fact that we can empathize with each other sets um, humans apart from systems like a fridge um, or a smart um, or a smart AI system that helps teaching completely. But is, is that where possibly the, the danger and the fear about AI comes in that um, is it going to become so powerful that it's going to um, take control of us? It doesn't need us as human beings anymore. And yet it, it doesn't have empathy, so it, it can't do everything that we do. That is exactly where the, the fear comes from. And I think that um, I think we have to I think we have to acknowledge that fear and and give it some space. So it's okay to, to be fearful of that. In fact, being fearful of that means that there's more chance that that won't happen. Um, you know, it's up to it's up to us to um, either become the policy makers and work in government to make sure that there is the, the right infrastructure in place for technology like this to remain um, beneficial to humans it's also our place to vote for those politicians and policy you know and, and policies and and put our voices out there and i think that there is a it's ours to lose i think is the best way to describe it um but what i have seen and i've been incredibly fortunate to be in the room when a lot of these discussions are happening is that everybody believes in um responsibly built autonomous AI machinery um, or systems or, um, or or software. And therefore that means that we are putting in place the right um, safeguards. Uh, but it is, it, it's not something we should take our eye off the ball on. Um, you know, we can't, we can't always trust the politicians to get it right. Absolutely, absolutely. But what, what do you think the, the next big breakthrough will be? Um, with with AI, what what's the biggest impact going to be that it will have in the next I don't know five years or so? Such a good question, and 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 I, I normally have like three answers, and I know them very well. But since um, since uh, the coronavirus crisis mm -hmm. and um, the the lockdown and, and and just the general thought about pandemics, I've really changed my view on 
potentially what will be the next big technology. Uh, I was very, very gung ho for autonomous driving vehicles. Um, and I feel less, less strongly about that because there's less, um, there is less focus potentially for me at the moment. I've not been in a car for almost five weeks. So I, um, but, but where I'm really excited is the AI systems that could help us with drug discovery, or with, um, with uh, patient uh, sort of logistics of bed capacity, and, and, and things that will help us with with our healthcare. And then the, th the third area is um, the climate. And I, I will, I've always believed that that is where we should focus this technology the most because it's the area where humans have really struggled to currently to create uh, breakthroughs that will reverse or, or address the, the you know the warming of, of this of this world so um, that's where I would like to see the most focus. And do, do you are there lots of things going on just that we don't know about looking into that kind of thing for the climate? There, there are um, there are we have um, at our conference, we have 18 stages, and one of them is dedicated just to the planet and, and smart cities. And, and I can't tell you how um, much more there is going on now than there was even four years ago when we had one session, and now we have 18. And um, no, we had 22. So there's been a, just a huge proliferation of, of more work. I, I, I still think that there's a lot further to go, though. Okay, I'm going to just change tack a little bit and ask you a bit about um, being an entrepreneur, because um, in Suffolk, since I've moved here, I have realised there are so many entrepreneurs, it's a real spirit of um, getting on and, and doing your own thing in this amazing um, part of the country. Mm -hmm. And many of our parents are entrepreneurs and their children, therefore, are really interested in setting up their own businesses. What advice would you give um, somebody who's 15, 16 about that? Firstly, Suffolk is great. <laughs> I'm in Suffolk right now. <laughs> I, I normally live in London, but since um, isolation, I've been in Suffolk and I've fallen totally in love with Suffolk. So um, Suffolk's wonderful. Uh, my advice for being an entrepreneur links quite closely with what I was saying about being practical um, and, and passionately practical, I really think you need to look for where there's a massive gap in, 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 in the market. Um, where is something not happening? And you can start really small, like what's not happening in your classroom, in your school, in your community, um, and then start to look what's not happening across across the country and the world or just in Suffolk. Um, and, and really putting yourself in the shoes of the people who are lacking that, whether it's a technology or a service or a product, um, and, and drilling down very hard into understanding what uh, what their needs are and then building something around that. Uh, the, 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 the worst way to be an entrepreneur is to build something for yourself, uh, I personally think, um, or I have found in the past, because then you're constantly, uh, the, only, the only person you can go kind of backwards and forwards with is, is, your own, um, is your own needs. Whereas if you can find a cohort of five, 10, 20, 30 millions of people who need something, you're then onto a successful, um, a chance of a successful business. I think the other thing is deciding whether you're going to be an entrepreneur for something on a small scale or um, something that scales. And I personally um, remember someone saying to me when I was younger, uh, you need to make money while you sleep. And that um, was something that at the time I didn't really understand. I was like, yeah, whatever, I'm going to be Anyway, a law photographer. Um, there's, you know, I had loads of uh, other ideas. I didn't really care about money, let alone entrepreneurship. But now I look back and I think the key to an entrepreneur is um, try not to build something where you're having to every single pound you earn physically uh, do something to earn it. So, um, uh, you know, if you're building um, a house, you're building one house, you're building the next house um, versus building, um, you know, a, a construction company that then will keep continue to go and grow and grow. And I think that's what the Internet's given us um, is the ability to build at scale really, really fast. So entrepreneurship is much easier, um, uh, at least to get started now than it was uh, 10 years ago, 10, 20 years ago.
I when you you in your first my first question I asked you about, uh -huh, I asked you about <laughs> models and um, you told me uh, you gave me various female role models and I'm just interested in your thoughts on women in the AI uh, industry um, and I know that you've you've spoken quite a lot about this before. Um, do schools need to do more to encourage girls to follow this path? Or you know, where, where does the fault lie? Why is it not the norm for women in AI? I don't think there's any fault. Um, I think that it's a systemic challenge across the whole um, across the whole of society. Um, that's a throwback to when um, you know when women weren't respected as equals. It, it has permeated and seeped into our society, and it's really hard to 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 get rid of that. Um, but we must keep doing more and more to do to, to in order to change that messaging. Um, I personally have created a group of women. Um, women in artificial intelligence and in, in and around the technology space um, and try my very darndest to get them in front of young girls all the time just so they can see what the potential is. Um, I've written a book called How to Talk to Robots and it's specifically aimed at young women. Um, not that young boys and, uh, and men shouldn't read it, but it's just that I have felt time and time again that things have been positioned in a way that traditionally men might find and boys might find more interesting. And so I have positioned um, this book really to address what I think there's the gap where, where young women just haven't been inspired in, in many cases. If you think about um, a maths problem, the difference between a math pro a maths problem, which um, is just about numbers versus a maths problem, which is about uh, people and how you can use maths to benefit people, suddenly my eyes light up. And that's not just me, that's all, that's my girlfriends too. Um, and so I think it's just about addressing the same technology from a different perspective. We have a hackathon for boys and girls. Um, and what I've found is that if you address the challenge around climate change or um, or healthcare, we often get more women signing up. And so there's a there's a key element just, just to just uh, reframing it, but the, the tech is the same. Um, so there's a, there's there's a few things we can do. Fantastic. Now I heard there's noises, and that is Otis, isn't it? You're that is Otis. There. And I suppose that that brings me neatly to uh, one of my last questions, which is, "Hi, Otis. Hello. Is, um, oh, hi. How how is life for you and your family with this lockdown? How how is it? Very working? dribbly. <laughs> very very dribbly. Well, I um. So Otis is is months last week um and uh he's my first uh little boy so it's been quite quite uh a interesting time as I've been learning how to be um a mother at the same time as running this big conference that I do in June every year so it has been a challenge but probably the best challenge or definitely the best challenge I've ever had um not only does he dribble to my headphones but he's oh. also just heaven um and I'm very lucky my partner Ed um and I we share all of the the child um all of the Otis looking after, all of the parenting. Uh, we do a two hour on, two hour off stint throughout the day. Oh no, I can't hear you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, and half the time, um, yeah, so half the time I'm looking after him and half the time I'm working. And it, I, I don't know, I kind of don't don't want it to go back to, to uh, any other way. But at the same time, I'm definitely not as productive. So um, I, I, I really feel for all the mothers out there, however old their children are, and the fathers, it's um, certainly not easy. <laughs> at the moment we have, obviously, all of our children are at home with their mums, dads and, and their families. And um, I think we're all finding our way yeah with it in yeah. and in the back of our minds hoping this isn't going to last for too long um i mean i'm at school yeah. and it's empty and i miss oh, them i bet you do I do but yeah. um what do you think society what? is going to change significantly once we come through all of this do you think there are going to be um we're going to prioritize things differently after after all of this i really hope so i um I'm so excited for, for, for to see 
you know, there's some really dreadful, dreadful things that are that are um, that this is that this is meant. Um, you know, people are dying. There's huge inequality being increased. There's unemployment. There's some really um, serious, serious um, ramifications. But at the same time, there are tiny silver linings all over the place. And what we need to do as a society, and all of us have got a, a role to play in this, is try and hold on to those silver linings and turn them into the whole cloud once this has passed. Um, and try and focus on the things that you've seen, where someone said to you last time, you know, a few years ago, or six months ago even, oh, that's not possible. Oh, we can't do that. Um, and that might be you know, turning Claridge's into a, um, into a, into a hotel for NHS staff. That would never have been possible. Or it might be, oh, we, we, I was told loads of my friends who work in banks, oh, you can never work at home. You're a mother? No, you can't ever work from home. Now they're working from home. So there's loads of things that, that personally and culturally as a whole society, I think we should hold on to and be like, actually, that was possible. And hopefully it will lead to more of an equal society as we go forward, because there's a huge um, there's a huge divide that needs to be that needs to be addressed. And I'm, I believe that this could be one of the catalysts that that, do, that does that for us. I mean, I'm super excited that Otis lives in a world where there isn't such a big divide. Um, but uh, we'll, we've all got some work to do to make sure that happens. Yes. Well, Tabitha, I'm going to draw this interview to a close. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you, Otis, as well. What you've thank said you, has, been, has been so interesting, inspirational. Um, I hope once all of this is over, you'll come and see us in person. I would love that. I'll just love come it. down the road. And, um, and, and good luck to all that you're doing. I hope that some of our pupils do come to your um, conference. Your conference, yes. We're definitely looking to that. Love, love, love. And many, many thanks. <laughs> and uh, enjoy Otis. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Say bye. Bye-bye.